Hi everyone, my name is Jayashree. I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin. And my research focuses on testing reliability of storage systems. And today I'm here to talk about uh, testing crash consistency of file systems using a set of tools that we built called Crash Monkey and ACE. This work was published at OSTI 2018. So let's get started. The agenda for the talk today would be as follows. I'll first introduce to you what crash consistency is and why is it important from the perspective of a file system. We'll also talk about what are crash consistency bugs and what could be the impact of crash consistency bugs. Next, we'll move on to understanding how to test for crash consistency bugs and what are the techniques available today to do so. We'll also discuss why these techniques today are inadequate and like what is the need for a new technique to testing crash consistency. With that, we'll move on to the infrastructure that we built called Crash Monkey, which is used to simulate crashes and automatically test for crash consistency of file systems. And to do so, we introduced a new technique to testing crash consistency, which we call the bounded black box crash testing. And we'll also discuss about our implementation of this technique, which is called ACE, or the Automatic Crash Explorer. I'll walk you through some of the evaluations that we have, and then I'll end off with a short demo. So let's start off with crash consistency. So data that is stored on storage devices, such as your hard disk drives or SSDs, is organized in the form of files and directories. And the data and metadata, which is the information about the files, have to be organized efficiently in different data structures on your storage device so that they can be easily accessible when needed. And these data structures have to be persisted on the disk, which means if there is a power loss, then these data, the data that are stored in these data structures must be retrievable and they must not be lost. Now, this is required because file systems can suffer from sudden unexpected crashes. These could be due to kernel panics or due to a power loss. And when such a crash occurs, all the in-memory state, that is everything in your DRAM, is completely wiped off. And what this means is that your on-disk data structures could be left in an in intermediate inconsistent state. So one of the core features that every file system aims to provide today is to make sure that the data and metadata is kept consistent across such system crashes. Say you're writing an important file, and you remembered to save the file. Now, if a sudden system crash occurs, and when your system boots back up, if you see that the file that you wrote to is completely missing, then that's totally unacceptable and might be very well frustrating for you. These are times you'd really wish that file systems were crash consistent. Now, the problem of crash consistency arises due to two main reasons. First, ordering. A single file system operation translates to a series of updates to multiple data structures on disk. And a crash could occur anyway in the middle of these a series of updates. And what this means is that one particular data structure might be updated while the other might not be. So this leads to an inconsistent state between two data structures, and that results in a file system inconsistency. And second, for the purpose of better performance, all these updates to different data structures are usually first performed in memory. And then periodically, they would be flushed to your secondary storage device. And because of this, it is important that you make sure to flush all of these updates that are performed in memory to the disk at appropriate times. If not, if a crash occurs, you might end up losing the data that was in memory because it's completely wiped off during a crash. Now, let's talk about both of these uh, characteristics that could lead to a crash in more detail with a few examples. Let's talk about how ordering is important to ensure crash consistency. Let's consider the example of a file append. Say you have a file foo, and you want to append a block of data to this file. Now, in order to do so, there would be three critical data structures that would be updated on disk. 
First, you have the inode, which has metadata related to the file. It has data such as uh, the size of the file, what are the pointers to the different data block that this file contains, and so on. So this has to be updated whenever you're appending a block of data to a file, because now your file size has changed, and you have actually appended a new block of, uh, new block of data to this, so you have to also update the pointer to the new data block that you have uh, appended. The second data structure that you have to update is the data bitmap. So the data bitmap indicates what is the current usage of the different data blocks that are on your device. So if you're writing, and then finally, you have to actually write the content to a new data block itself. So the most critical point here is that these three updates to these different data structures must happen in a particular order. So let's see what happens if you write these in completely different orders and a crash occurs anywhere in the middle of these writes. So let's say in the first case, we update the data block first. So you have written the block of data to the on-disk uh, data structure. And before you could update the inode and the data bitmap, say a crash occurred. At this point, the, the file system is still consistent because the data bitmap and the inode still agree on what data blocks are being used on your file system. There's no inconsistency in what they report. But although you have written your data block there, your inode has no pointer to the data block, so that data block can never be accessed. So you're basically losing data here. Now let's consider a second case where, say, you instead updated the inode first. And here, before you could update the data bitmap and the data block itself, say a crash occurred. So here, the file system is in an inconsistent state because the inode claims that a particular data block has been allocated. But the data bitmap says that that exact same data block has not been allocated to any file because you haven't updated it. And on a crash, the only thing that persisted is your inode. So because of this, there's a file system inconsistency in what they report to be the usage of data blocks. And also, because your inode has a pointer to a particular data block, that data block could actually be allocated to a completely different file or could be unallocated, which means you could be pointing to completely garbage data. Now, in the third case, say you updated the data bitmap first. And again, before you could update the inode and the data block, say you suffered a crash. At this point, again, the file system is in an inconsistent state because your data bitmap says that you have allocated a particular block, of, block to a file, but your inode says that you haven't allocated any data. So what this means is that there is a space leak, which is this particular data block can now not be allocated to any other file on your system and that's going to just lie there, useless. So as you can see, ordering is very critical to ensuring crash consistency. If you, write, uh, if you write all your updates in any random order, a crash at a random point in time can lead your on-disk data structures to be inconsistent. So how did file system developers fix these kind of issues? So the simplest approach here is that just don't care about ordering. Write it in any possible order that you want. But when a crash occurs, your file system will be in an inconsistent state. And the way you solve this is that you run a file system-wide checker, such as FSCK, which would go through every block of data in your uh, file system and would check if there is an inconsistency and try to fix the inconsistency. So as you might have guessed already, this is not an efficient approach because, say, you had a very large file system partition the time taken to scan the entire partition and fix all the inconsistencies in this partition is going to be terribly long. And this is not a practical approach. But earlier file systems like ext2 use these kind of approaches. And another point here is that the way in which FSCK fixes inconsistencies could actually lead to data loss. Because in order to fix an inconsistency, it might just say, let me deallocate this block and say it was never written. So you're going to lose the data that was actually written previously. But the approach that file systems of today use is called is using a transaction log. 
So this is basically a journal that is stored on disk. And you basically log all of the updates to these data structures first into this journal, commit the journal, write it onto the disk. At this point, if the file system suffers a crash, you always know that you can go back to the journal, replay all the updates in the journal, and be able to recover your file system to a consistent state. So most of the file systems today, like the ext4, f2fs, butterfs, and xfs, use this technique in order to ensure ordering to provide crash consistency. So we spoke about how ordering is crucial to ensuring crash consistency. Let's now talk about persistence. So the updates to the data structures that we spoke about so far are first performed in memory. And then periodically, a background thread would flush these updates to the on-disk data structures. While this is great for performance, because the access latencies of a disk is orders of magnitude higher than that of DRAM, this means that you have to ensure that the data blocks have been returned to disk at regular intervals of time. This might not be applicable or uh, permissible by some applications, because they might have stringent requirements about how they, what, the, what guarantees they provide with respect to persistence. So for that reason, file system provides us with interfaces such as fsync, fdatasync, or sync. What these system calls do is that if you call fsync on a particular file, it makes sure that the data and metadata corresponding to this file is safely returned to disk by the time the system call returns. So these are synchronous operations that ensure that data is safely returned to disk. So say we have the same old example. You have a file foo, and you're trying to append a block of data to file foo. If you don't call any of these persistence operation, and say a system crash occurred at this point, the file system can recover to either the initial state where the appended block of data is completely lost, or it could recover to a state where the appended block of data is retrieved. Both of these are completely valid uh, states to which the file system can recover. But say you have the same append operation, and now you explicitly call an fsync on this file foo. And once the fsync has returned, say your system crashed. At this point, your file system should always be able to recover the appended block of data. If it is not able to recover it, then that is a crash consistency bug. So for the rest of the talk today and in this work, the kind of bugs that we are trying to find is of the second sort, where you have explicitly called a persistence operation on, in your workload, and you're trying to find if these persistent guarantees were broken. That is, even after calling an fsync or fdata sync, the data or the metadata is corrupt. These are the kind of crash consistency bugs that we are going to deal with. So to summarize what we have discussed so far, Crash ensuring crash consistency in file systems is non-trivial. And it requires that all your uh, on-disk data structures are persisted in a particular order. Now, the impact of such crash consistency bugs could be very severe. It could lead to metadata corruption. That is, it could lead to missing files or directories, or it might like, not persist the hard links of files, file size, etc. It could lead to data corruption. Your data could be half written, or your data could be completely lost. And in some more critical cases, it might just make your file system unmountable. You wouldn't be able to repair your file system without expert help. So to better understand the consequences of such crash consistency bugs, let me walk you through a real example which occurred in the ButterFS file system. And this was in Linux kernel 4.16, so this was not so long ago, just a year ago. So here on the right-hand side, I'm showing a blue box where I'm going to show the workload that is used to trigger this bug. And you can imagine that this is a workload that any application could simply issue. It is just a sequence of system calls. And here I'm showing the memory and the storage component. So initially, all the writes that we do would go into memory, and when you call the persistence operation, which is the fsync or fdata sync, they would be returned to the storage device. So let's say we create a directory A. And then you create a file bar within this directory. Everything is in memory so far. 
And now you call an fsync operation on the file A bar, which means you're persisting the file bar onto your storage device. Now you go on and create another directory B and the file with the same name bar in a new directory. And this could have a completely different content compared to the file bar in directory A. We don't care about that right now. And now you want to rename the file bar from directory B to directory A. Once you have done that, you're going to create a sibling file in the directory A, which is foo, and you're going to persist the file foo. So at this point, if a system crash occurs, you would expect that the two files that you explicitly persisted, which is the file bar and the file foo in directory A, must be present when the file system recovers from the crash. But in the ButterFS file system, what happened was that the file bar, which you had explicitly persisted before, went completely missing. And this was during the rename operation. So why did this bug occur? If you look at the rename operation here, because you're moving, renaming a file with the same name in two directories, this rename operation happens in a series of two steps. First, you have to unlink or remove the file in the directory A, and then you have to move the file from directory B to directory A. And for the rename operation in itself to be atomic, both of these steps must happen atomically. But what happened in ButterFS was that the first operation went through, you ended up removing the file bar from directory A, but before the second operation, which is the move, could complete, the, uh, it crashed. F-Sync basically did not persist this operation. And because of this, you ended up losing the file A bar, which you never intended to remove. This bug existed in the Linux kernel since 2014. And it was revealed by our tools, CrashMonkey and Ace, in 2018. So now this raises a very important question as to how are crash consistency bugs being tested for today? So there are two major efforts in testing crash consistency of file systems. The first is the verified file systems, which have provable crash consistency guarantees. But the main downside here is that these file systems have to be built from scratch. You cannot use this technique to test for the crash consistency of existing mature file systems like ext4. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have techniques like model checking, where you can give a list of specifications and see if your file system adheres to these specifications. But the downside here is that you, you might have to annotate the file system code in order to enable these techniques. And this could be a very tedious procedure. And the state-of-the-art testing technique today is a regression test suite called the XFS test, which is a collection of about 500 tests. But the point here is that only 5% of these tests check the file system for crash consistency behaviors. All the others simply focus on correctness. So one way to, to be able to systematically test for file system crash consistency is to explore the space of all possible workloads and then systematically see if any of these workloads result in a bug. But there are two main challenges with such systematic testing. First, there is no automated infrastructure as of today in order to simulate crashes and automatically check if your file system recovers to a consistent state. And second, the space of workloads that you would want to explore for is infinite. So how do you bound the space? You cannot, uh, you cannot test for an infinite number of workloads. Our work is aimed at addressing both of these challenges to build an automated end-to-end -end infrastructure for testing crash consistency bugs in Linux file systems. We call our approach the bounded black box crash testing, which is a new approach to testing file system crash consistency. Bcube works by generating sequences of file system operations called workloads in a bounded state space. To be able to do this, we built a tool called the Automatic Crash Explorer, or ACE. 
It then simulates crashes at different points along these workloads and automatically checks if your file system is able to recover to a consistent state after the crash. And to do this, we built CrashMonkey. B-Cube focuses on finding reproducible bugs that result in severe consequences like metadata and data corruption. And we focus ex on bugs where you explicitly call a persistence operation and still the data and metadata of the persisted files and directories are corrupt. We make no assumptions about files that have not been persisted. So using our technique, we were able to find 10 new bugs across two Linux file systems, ButterFS and F2FS. We also found a bug in our verified file system, FSCQ. So in a room full of practitioners, if you're wondering why should you care to use our tools, then here's the answer. Our tools are fully automated, which means you don't need to write Man, you don't need to manually write workloads or checkers for these workloads in order to test for crash consistency. Our tools are completely black box, which means you can just use them out of the box on any POSIX compliant file system. You don't have to annotate or modify any file system code. Our, file, our tools are file system agnostic, which means you don't have any file system specific changes to be made uh, in order to run our tools. It can work on any of the POSIX compliant file systems. And most importantly, our, our tools are able to reveal new, previously unknown bugs in Linux file systems. So let's compare our approach with existing crash consistency techniques as of today. So we have verified file system, model checking, and the regression test suite XFS tests. And we're comparing this uh, against our technique, which is B-Cube. So techniques like verified file system, model checking, or XFS tests, all of them need, need you to manually write workloads and checkers in order to uh, test, again, test for crash consistency. Whereas in B-Cube, ACE would automatically generate the workloads and checkers for you. Techniques like verified file systems and model checking are not black box which means they are very custom made to a particular file system. If you want to test them against a different file system, you would have to modify the file system code. And techniques like XFS test, which is a regression test suite, cannot reveal new or previously unknown bugs because you're going to test the exact same set of workloads against every new file system release. So it's only, it will only be able to tell you if the same bug occurs in a newer version of your Linux kernel but it cannot tell you if there's a previously unknown bug that, that occurs in this new version of the kernel. So with all this background on crash consistency, let's deep dive into CrashMonkey and how CrashMonkey works. So CrashMonkey was built in order to address the need for an automated infrastructure for crash consistency testing. So CrashMonkey is a record and replay framework that records all of the block I.O. requests that are issued to the storage device and replays them. And it crashes at different points along this replay and then automatically tests if your file system is able to recover to a consistent state. And to do so for performance reasons, CrashMonkey uses a copy on write RAM block device that is an in-memory block device instead of actually writing to a storage device. So I said CrashMonkey simulates crashes. So you might have an obvious question, why don't you actually crash the file system? Why do you have to simulate a crash? Yes, of course you can actually crash a file system. You could just run a file system on a virtual machine, run a workload, and then pull off the power from the virtual machine, crash it. But then the main downside here is that rebooting the system after the crash is going to be time consuming especially if you're going to test it against a lot of workloads, then you'd spend a lot of time just rebooting the machine and not doing the actual testing job. And also, this technique is unlikely to reveal a lot of bugs because you have no knowledge about where you're crashing. 
you're going to randomly pull the power plug off, and that is unlikely to result in bugs. Because as we'll discuss further, we'll see that to reveal a bug, an exact sequence of operations are required, and a crash is required at a particular point during this operation. So another approach to doing this would be to run your file system in user space as a process and just kill the process at different points in time. So this addresses both of the challenges with power cycling a VM. It is more uh, fine-grained because you can control where you want to simulate a crash. And also, it is not as slow because you just have to kill and restart a process. But the main problem here is that not all file systems can be run in user space. So you might have to rewrite the file system significantly to provide this functionality, which is not quite feasible for mature file systems of today. And for this reason, CrashMonkey simulates crashes instead of actually crashing. So let's now see how CrashMonkey achieves this crash simulation. So we have uh, two components here, the user space component and the kernel space component. And we are going to look at how the Linux storage stack looks so that I can explain you better how CrashMonkey instruments it in order to trace these requests. So you have your workload, which you can think of as an application in the user space. And in the kernel space, you first have your file system. Although I show it as one box, uh, you should actually imagine this file system to be your VFS layer, virtual file system, along with the page cache and the actual file system in itself. And, and then you have the generic block layer, which is basically the interface between the file system and the device driver. And at, at the generic block layer, the unit of I.O. is called the block I.O. or BIO. And these block I.O. requests are sent to the block device driver, which is your device-specific driver, and then it propagates to your disk. Now, for performance reasons, CrashMonkey is going to replace your actual block device with an in-memory block device. And the core functionality of how CrashMonkey simulates crashes lies in the device wrapper that sits around your custom uh, block device. And this is going to record all of the block I.O. requests that are sent down from the generic block layer. And to simulate a crash, what we need to do is that at a particular point in the workload, we would, uh, we would insert some checkpoint operations, which are custom operations. And beyond that uh, point, we would just drop all of the block I.O. requests. That is equivalent to a crash happening at that particular point. Because even in the face of a crash, what would happen is that all the requests beyond that point wouldn't actually be received by your disk. So this is how CrashMonkey would simulate your crash. And in order to do so, it will actually pull all these logged block I.O. requests into the user space, and the test harness in the user space is going to create these different crash states for you. So that said, we'll see how CrashMonkey uh, tests a given workload end-to-end. Say you start from an initial file system state and execute a workload on CrashMonkey. This workload will internally be split into a sequence of block I.O. requests, which are interleaved by what we call the persistence points. And these persistence points are the calls to F-Sync or F-Data Sync operations, which are meant to flush dirty data to disk. And now, let's see what CrashMonkey does when it encounters the first persistence point. So CrashMonkey would record all of the block I.O. requests that it received up to the persistence point. We call this the record phase. So in addition to simply recording these requests, it would also safely unmount your disk at this point in order to flush any background pending I.O. operations due to the modification of global data structures. So at this point, we snapshot the file system image, and we call this the oracle. This represents the true state of the file system that it should recover to in the face of no crashes. So this is your expected file system state after the crash. So in the second phase, CrashMonkey would replay all of these recorded block I.O. requests up to the persistence point. And then it would allow your file system to perform its own journal recovery operations. And it snapshots this phase of the file system, and we call this the crash state. This is the actual state of the file system when a crash has occurred. And the third stage is testing for consistency. CrashMonkey's auto-checker has three vital pieces of information 
to automatically check for crash consistency. First, it has the oracle, which is the expected state of the file system after the crash. It has the crash state, which is the actual state in which your file system is after it has faced a crash. And then you have the instrumented workload from which we figure out what are the files and directories that were persisted during the workload execution so that we can check for things like the data of the persisted files, metadata of the persisted files, and we do some generic checks such as whether your file system mounts successfully, whether your file system is writable once it is mounted, and so on. And if there is an inconsistency in any of these tests, CrashMonkey would, uh, would produce a bug report. So, so far, we saw how given a workload, which is compliant to POSIX API, CrashMonkey can generate crash states and automatically check for consistency. But the next question is, how would you automatically generate workloads that CrashMonkey can execute on? Now, there are several factors that result in an infinite work workload space. First, what is the number of operations that you want to include in your workload? These are basically the number of system calls in your workload. What are the file system operations or system calls that should be present in your workload? What should the parameters to each of these file system operations be? What should the initial state of the file system from which you start testing be? And where along the workload do you want to simulate a crash? Now that brings us to a new technique of, simulating cra uh, of testing crash consistency in a bounded space called the bounded black box crash testing. So the idea in Bcube is simple. Bcube would bound the whole state space of workloads along three dimensions. First, the number of operations in your workload, which is the length of the workload. The second, the arguments to each of these uh, file system operations in the workload. And third, the initial state of the file system from which you start testing. So what, uh, what Bcube does is that it first positions all the known existing crash consistency bugs in this workload space, and then it would draw a generic bound around this workload space. And now, it would exhaustively generate all possible workloads within this bounded space, and it would find any hidden bugs in this space of workloads. Now, if you have more computational power, it is easy to expand this bound and test exhaustively within this bound, and you might as well be able to find newer bugs in this larger workload space. So one important design decision that Bcube makes is the choice of crash points. That is, where along the workload do you want to simulate a crash? Bcube restricts crashes to only after persistence operations such as F-Sync or F-Data Sync. And it does not crash in the middle of a system call. Now, this design is motivated due to two main reasons. Uh, oh, before that, so this, in this workload, which was basically the rename atomicity bug that we discussed in the ButterFS file system, uh, uh, Bcube would simulate a crash after the first F-Sync operation and the second F-Sync operation. So you would basically test for two crash states in this case. So getting, to, getting back to the point, the reason for the choice of crash states after persistence points is that developers are motivated to patch bugs which violate the crash consistency guarantees that these persistence operations provide. They're more concrete, and developers consider it a serious bug if it violates your F-Sync or F-Data Sync guarantees. And second, if you crash in the middle of a system call, then there is an exponentially large state of uh, possible states that you could recover to, which are all correct. For instance, say you crashed in the middle of a write system call. And when your file system recovers, it could either recover to nothing being written, or data being partially written, or data being completely written. All of them are valid, because there is no guarantee that the file system provides unless there is an F-Sync operation. So to avoid these, uh, our, our work concerns only with simulating crashes after persistence operations. So the Bcube approach is, does have its own limitations. Bcube does not guarantee finding all possible crash consistency bugs in a given file system. 
it assumes that the journaling mechanisms or the copy on write mechanisms in the file system functions correctly. So it does not simulate crashes in the middle of a file system operation. And Bcube can only reveal if a bug has occurred in your file system. It cannot pinpoint to you what is the reason for the bug or where exactly did the bug occur. And if you want to ge uh, generate workloads which are of longer sequence length or really large workload, then you would need higher computational power in order to deal with a technique like Bcube. Now, Bcube is this whole idea or technique for crash consistency testing. Our implementation of this technique is the Automatic Crash Explorer, or ACE. Recall that Bcube bounds the workload space along three dimensions. The length of the workload, the arguments to each of the system calls in the workload, and the initial file system state. Now, to find an exact bound uh, or an exact value for each of these bounds, what we do is we study the existing crash consistency bugs in the Linux kernel, and we try to derive insights from the study and then appropriately fix bounds for ACE. So to do so, we looked at the Linux kernel mailing list and the regression test suite XFS test, and we studied a total of 26 unique bugs across three different file systems, F2FS, ext 4 and ButterFS, that were reported in the last five years. Note that there were only 26 unique bugs that were reported in the last five years. So the major insights, uh, so we classify the results of our study based on the consequence of the bug, that is whether it leads to metadata corruption or data corruption or unmountable file systems. And by the file system type, that is the file system on which it occurred, and by the number of core file system operations that were present in the workload that was required to trigger this bug. So the main insights from our study are as follows. First, crash consistency bugs are really hard to find. There have been bugs in the Linux kernel that were present for almost seven years before they were discovered. And this is because it's really hard to get to a crash consistency bugs because it requires a specific sequence of operations and a crash at a specific point along this workload. So an ad hoc technique where you randomly just crash the workload is very unlikely to reveal crash consistency bugs. And crash consistency bugs typically involved reuse of file and directory names. Those were corner cases that weren't handled correctly in most file systems. Second, small workloads, meaning workloads that had only two to three core file system operations were sufficient to reveal most of these 26 crash consistency bugs. And you did not require a special initial file system state to start from. You could just start from a clean file system state and within two to three core file system operations, you got to all these existing crash consistency bugs. And third, all the crash consistency bugs that we studied required a crash only after the persistence point. There was no bug that we studied where the crash uh, during the system call resulted in a consistency bug. And finally, systematic testing is very important. For instance, uh, in the ButterFS file system, there was a bug where in the, to the f allocate system call, if you passed on this argument, which is punch hole, the blocks of data that was appended was lost. And this bug was found in 2015. And almost three years later, when someone tested the exact same workload with a different argument to the system call, just a parameter option, the exact same bug was revealed. So what this means is that if you had a systematic testing approach, all these kinds of bugs could have been found in the first place. So based on these insights, ACE picks specific bounds along each of these three dimensions. So it restricts the maximum number of operations in a workload to three. That's because we saw that most of the crash consistency bugs we studied hardly required two to, two to three core file system operations. 
and it restricts the arguments to the system calls to a really small uh, set of files and directories because we saw that reusing the file and directory names was crucial in revealing bugs. So we use a small, uh, just a two-level two deep directory hierarchy with just two files in each directory. And when it comes to data-related system calls, we saw that the exact offset length pair was not required to simulate a bug. Instead, it was simply abstractions such as whether you are appending to a file, whether you are writing to the start of the file, or whether you are overwriting the file that resulted in these bugs. So we just use these kinds of abstractions instead of using specific uh, values for these arguments. And we start from a clean and really small, which is 100 MB file system every time for our testing, because all the bugs that we studied, except one, did not require a special file system state. So um, let's see how AS generates workloads. It does so in four phases. In the first phase, A selects the skeleton for the workload. Say you have an operation set where you have just four system calls that you want to test, create, link, rename, and write. So in the first phase, ACE is going to exhaustively generate all possible combinations. Here we are generating sequences of length two. So all possible combinations of length two, which is a total of 16 combinations. So let's see how one of these combinations translates to a workload. Let's say we pick the create followed by rename here. So in the second step, ACE would pick parameters to each of these system calls. And it would do so from the file set that we have. And as I said before, we have just two directories with two files in each directory. So it would just pick a random file for each of these uh, system calls. And note that I'm showing only one of the possible combinations here. And in practice, ACE is going to parallelly generate all possible combinations of these uh, arguments uh, to create multiple workloads. So in the third, sta uh, third stage, we are going to optionally add a persistence point after each of these system calls. So here, in this particular example, we chose to add fsync after each of the system calls. And again, the file or the argument to this operation must also be chosen. And in the final state, we're going to add dependencies. So if you look at this workload, the first operation creates a file A bar. But we didn't really make sure that directory A exists. So if you just ran this workload on any POSIX compliant file system, it would just fail. So in this st stage, what we do is we add these kind of dependencies. So here, we first create the directory A before creating the file within the directory, and so on. So this final workload here is exactly the same workload that was required to trigger the rename atomicity bug that we discussed uh, in the beginning of the talk. And as you might notice here, although we started from a set of just two core file system operations, the final workload here can contain a lot more system calls. But we call this workload uh, that of sequence length two because we started off with just two uh, system calls. So to summarize, we identified two main challenges with systematic testing of file system crash consistency. And we built two tools, CrashMonkey and ACE, to address both of these challenges. Now, let's look at the evaluation of all of this really quick. So the main questions that we want to answer is here is that, are our tools able to reproduce the existing bugs? And are they able to find new bugs in the Linux file systems? And can it do so in a reasonable time and resource bound? And how can we generalize and scale an approach like this? So our, we tested uh, all these on the academic cloud computing testbed called the Chameleon Cloud. And we had a cluster of about 65 nodes, each of them running multiple virtual machines. Uh, so we had a total of 780 virtual machines running in parallel, testing all of our workloads. And to show the results, we tested, we're going to test uh, sequences of length 1, 2, and 3. And we further restricted sequences of length 3 because the whole set of sequence 3 was about 25 million workloads, which would have taken 15 days of testing according to our setup. But for a big company which has dedicated resources for testing, this is peanuts. So it's not a big deal for them. But for us, we had restricted the set to just separate out the metadata and the data operations. 
So we tested a total of 3.37 million workloads across all of these different sequence lengths. And we were able to reproduce 26 bugs. We couldn't reproduce two bugs. And because they required a specific file system operation, which we did not include, which was like drop cache. And the other one required a special file system state, which is like creating thousands of hard links to a particular file. So because we did not include that in ACE, we couldn't generate it. But again, by increasing the bound space of ACE, you will be able to cover those bugs. In addition to these 26 bugs, which was found in the last five years, in just two hours of two days of testing, we were able to find 10 new bugs across ButterFS and F2FS file systems. And here, when I say two days, it is two days of testing per file system. So another important question that we ask is that verified file systems are supposed to have provable crash consistency guarantees. So are they really crash consistency bug free? We tested two verified file systems, FSCQ and YXv6. And we found one crash consistency bug in a verified file system, which is FSCQ. And in addition to this bug, all the bugs that we spoke about previously have been acknowledged and patched by the kernel developers. Um, so the bug in FSCQ here is that verified file systems also have unverified components, such as the device drivers. And they have these bindings between verified and unverified code, which is again unverified. So there could be bugs in all these different components. And also, there could be bugs in the specification of verified file systems. So all these can effectively result in crash consistency bug, and that is what we found here. So the bug here was that if you write some, if you append a block of data to a file and then call an F data sync on the file, it is supposed to persist the data, but when the, when the file system crashed and recovered, the data was lost. So what this basically means is that even if you have verification, you cannot get away with testing because verified file system can also have bugs. So yeah, the same results are summarized here. So another important angle for the evaluation is how can you generalize an approach like ACE or what is the effort it takes to generalize ACE? So ACE is definitely open source, so you can play around with it and try adding new system calls to ACE or try increasing the bound to generate uh, to generate larger sequences. And the effort involved in doing so is a few 50 to 100 lines of code. So it's a half a day of work for any developer, I would say. And in addition to this, in order to test workloads of different sequence lengths, we have tried integrating a fuzzer to ACE so that instead of bounding yourself to a particular sequence and trying to explore, uh, explore it um, completely, we can try generating random workloads in this bounded space so that you get a more reach than what it currently is. So if you're interested in trying out our tools, both CrashMonkey and Ace are open source. And we've put in a lot of effort to document our tools as much as possible, right from how to set up a VM and get CrashMonkey running on the VM to advance documentation on how can you generate workloads for CrashMonkey, how can you expand or generalize ACE further, and so on. But for those of you who want to like quickly try out our tools without customizing it much, we also have a pre-generated test suite of about 328 workloads of sequence length one, which you could just run by using a single command line. And this operation is going to test your file system against all of these workloads, which is going to take around 15 minutes or so. And at the end of that, it's going to give you a bug report that says whether your file system was crash consistent or not. So our tools have had quite a bit of impact. In addition to finding 10 long-standing bugs in Linux file systems, all of which have been patched by the Linux kernel developers, and a bug in the verified file system, which has also been patched, we have contributed our test cases to the Linux uh, regression test suite, XFS test. And our work spurred a lot of discussion in the Linux file system mailing, uh, mailing groups about the need to document the crash consistency guarantees provided by each of the different file systems, because each file system has a different guarantee, 
and they all provide more than what the POSIX asks them to, because POSIX is really vague, and you definitely need to provide something more than POSIX. So we are in the process of trying to help them document the different crash consistency behaviors of file systems. And these, our tools have also been used in uh, research-based file systems like Barrier FS to test their crash consistency guarantees. So what's the high-level point that we learn from Bcube? Even if you build verified software, testing is important. And a tool that is very general might not be able to find bugs as much as a custom tool that is application aware, which is aware of the semantics or the uh, intricacies of the application that you're testing for. So with that, let me show you a quick demo. So in this demo, what we are going to do is we have restricted the workload set of A's to only, con only test for just two file system operations, which would be FLAKIT and LINK. And our uh, set of files is also really small, just to run everything quickly. Right. So with this small set of workloads, uh, it has generated a total of just nine workloads, and it's kind of compiling them. But if you're running a pre-generated test suite, you can just compile these workloads once and then run them on any file system. So it's now going to run all these nine tests uh, on the ButterFS file system of partition size 100 MB. And each test takes about three to five seconds. Right. And you can see that within three test cases, it has already found a bug. And this is Linux kernel 4.16, which was the latest as of last year when we did the work. So the bug here says that the blocks that were allocated at the end of the file using an f allocate system call were not persisted even though you explicitly called an f-sync operation, which means you basically lost data blocks that were appended to the end of the file. And then you have another uh, test where you have a metadata corruption, which is you create a link to a file and you persist the file, but when a crash occurs and when your system recovers, you find that the new link that you created has gone completely missing. So out of nine workloads that it tested, it has already found three bugs. And this was like the latest kernel version as of last year. So to summarize whatever we discussed today, file system crash consistency bugs can result in severe consequences ranging from metadata corruption, data corruption, and the file system being completely unusable. And to address the lack of infrastructure in order to test for crash consistency bugs, we built Crash Monkey. And in order to address the need for an automated workload generator, we built ACE. And we study the pattern of previously known bugs in order to guide the bound selection for ACE. And using these techniques, we were able to find 10 new bugs in Linux file systems and a bug in a verified file system. So Crash Monkey and ACE is a collaborative effort of an excellent group of students at UT Austin and our advisor, Professor Vijay Chidambaram. With that, I'll conclude my talk, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, for questions, please raise your hand. Any questions now? All right. Uh, if so, then... Thank you for the talk. Uh, is this approach uh, applicable for other parts of the kernel or maybe a software in general? Um, so you can, appro uh, you can apply the bounded black box testing to any software that you want, but the way in which you derive these bounds and how you generate workloads will be very different if you want to test different parts of the kernel. 